the adult stem cell, the behavior of the adult stem cell, the markers it expresses on its surface, and its ability to, to uh, proliferate, regenerate, and repopulate during damage is the true marker of biologic age. And speaking of biologic age, uh, how many of you are familiar with the lifelike assay, HTQ fish? Anybody? Okay, someone? Okay, so HTQ fish is an assay that we use to look at telomere length. And when you see uh, the percentage of short telomeres, you can assign biologic age. I think that's a great assay, and I use it a lot. Um, but I think once we're able to apply that assay to stem cells, we'll really have something. Okay, a couple more definitions that you're going to come across if you decide to read more about stem cells. Asymmetric division. Normally, when cells divide, they give rise to two daughter cells. Stem cells usually give rise to a, a progeny that may or may not stay a stem cell. It usually will go down and become something else. But they usually keep themselves as stem cells. Um, the self-maintenance probability is uh, something that changes as the stem cell becomes less stem-like. The more stem-like, the more it's able to reproduce itself. The less stem-like and the more it goes down that differentiation pathway, the less it can reproduce itself as a stem cell. It can't do that. At least we didn't think it could until we discovered uh, induced pluripotent stem cells and something called uh, recirculation, which I'm going to talk to you about. Recirculation is going to become a very, very important feature in skin stem cell behavior. Level of commitment increases as we go towards a somatic cell. Technically, and up until a few years ago, until we discovered how to do IPS, um, the stem cells, once they became fully committed, that's what they were. They were a skin cell, they were a nose cell, they were an eye cell, they were a heart cell. Um, the niche. The niche is where stem cells live. And so most stem cells are living in some type of protected niche environment that's very different from anything else around them. And uh, the way they repopulate this niche is by clonal expansion of specific stem cells in there. Most niches, we think, have stem cells that never do anything but repopulate the niche. Um, steady state. Ideally, the niche, this place where stem cells come from, is in a steady state. Uh, it's regulated that way. It shouldn't be expanding uh, any more than it needs to to replenish uh, uh, the demands of regenerating uh, the body and tissues. Um, but as we age, you'll see the steady state goes, uh, it changes, and the steady state declines. So we have this concept that stem cells don't age. That's a myth. Stem cells age. They age differently, and we don't really know exactly all the mechanisms why they age, but they definitely age. They're definitely susceptible to radical oxygen species. They're definitely susceptible to telomere shortening. And telomeres are going to come up a couple times in this talk. I, I want to bring something up to you. Another myth that we hear is that stem cells are expressing lots and lots of telomerase. That's actually not true. Other than germ cells, which do have a pretty significant uh, rise in telomerase, stem cells in general are not expressing that much. They're expressing more than a somatic cell. But remember, most somatic cells don't express any telomerase. Why do stem cells have this? They, it's part of their regeneration mechanism for themselves. Longer telomeres means a younger cell functionally, as well as uh, um, in appearance, in phenotype, and probably in genotype. Um, I'm going to skip fusion here. Uh, cytokines and chemokines, we've already described. These are small, usually small molecules that are, are influential uh, in determining the behavior and the location and um, the actual differentiation process of the stem cell. Um, one thing I want to say about the, the cytokines and chemokines is that we've identified lots of them. And the actual identification process has been going on for over 30 years. It's just we didn't know quite how to apply them, and we didn't have a good delivery mechanism. When you're talking about skin, as you'll see, the location of the stem cells makes them amenable to cytokine therapy, but you have to be able to get whatever it is that you're using to the target. Um, some things uh, to discuss in terms of what happens with, with the actual behavior of stem cells and their progeny. Now, in skin, right now, there are many, many different types of cells identified, but we're going to talk specifically about epidermal cells and fibroblasts. That doesn't mean there aren't lots of other cells. There are immune cells in there. There are all kinds of um, tactile cells in there, neural cells, etc. But in terms of what causes our skin to, to look old, it's differences in collagen production, differences in elastin production, differences in the types of collagen, and then, of course, in the stem cell niche, we have fewer divisions, the cells are lazy, they get want to sit in a rocking chair and don't want to do much. 
There are more of what we call senescent cells that we can identify by cell surface markers. And just a word about senescence, uh, you hear this term a lot. Um, senescence is not the benign process we used to think about. Uh, several high-level researchers, including my friend Mike West and um, Carol Greeter, have done quite a bit of research in what uh, is now known as the senescent activated phenotype. Now, senescent shouldn't be activated, right? It should be sitting in a rocking chair, waiting to do whatever they do, removing themselves from the circulating population. It's not what happens. They elute inflammatory chemicals. What does this mean? This means that aging is a self-fulfilling prophecy. Once you start increasing aging cells, you start increasing intrinsically in the milieu of those cells inflammatory uh, chemicals, chemokines, and cytokines. So uh, aging is, is a domino effect, and there's lots of reasons to intervene, uh, not just for these uh, physical reasons and uh, appearance reasons. The other thing, the very last word there, recirculation, I mentioned to you, what's very, very interesting, and I'm, I'll show you a picture of this later, is that sometimes stem cells take a 180-degree turn and go back into the niche. Some of you may have seen in the past couple of months the, the uh, autopsy reports on uh, uh, the uh, lady, it was a Dutch lady that lived to be, I think, 114 years old. Anybody see that in the newspaper? You remember that? Remember that? And one of the things they said was that she, in her bone marrow biopsy, she had two functional stem cells. So as a chemokine cytokine guy and somebody who actually uses this topically to Im improve the appearance of skin, decrease wrinkles, et cetera, et cetera, people have been coming up to me and saying, well, aren't you going to burn out that niche? Aren't you going to uh, use up all those stem cells the way that 114-year-old Dutch lady? Uh, probably not because the stem cells have this behavior not only of repopulation within the niche, but some of them will actually take a 180-degree turn and go back into the niche and de-differentiate. So stem cells do sometimes de-differentiate, and we find this in skin. Uh, I think it's been seen in small intestine, but so far, uh, those are the two areas, but I'm pretty certain that happens in just about every organ uh, system that we look at. Remembering Dolly, why, why Dolly? Well, Dolly, remember, you can create an entire organism from one cell. So this was the hope and the potential of stem cells. We thought we were just going to inject them in there, and they were going to go to the, wherever they needed to be, and they were going to make new cells. And that's, that's not what happens. What happens is, and this is something I do, uh, not in this country because it's illegal, but what happens is when you in, uh, infuse stem cells into joints and other areas, it's the cytokines and chemokines that influence the surrounding cells, including the surrounding nascent stem cells, to behave like younger cells. Okay? One thing you should know, if you inject stem cells into a joint, 90 days later you won't be able to find any of those things that you injected. So it's not the cells dividing the way we used to think, you know, five or ten years ago. It's the cytokines and the chemokines, they elute, that makes them effective. I'm going to skip the structure. I just basically described it to you uh, before. There's lots of things in the skin. And um, I will simply say that when you design uh, some type of uh, cosmeceutical or, or nutraceutical or anything that, of that nature, uh, the more effective it is, is because you're actually covering more of these things. You're not just focusing on one thing. So if you can add agents that, say, improve the epigenetic expression in that cell, make it more useful. If you can do something that improves vascular tone, improves vascularity, improves the health of the vascular endothelium. If you can do something that improves mitochondrial uh, bioenergetics, then you're really covering a lot of different things in the cells. Okay, I have a dear friend in Madrid, Spain, named Maria Blasco, uh, who originated the HTQ fish, aka the lifelink test. And she was able to use this technology to do something called telomapping. And what she discovered was that stem cells tend to have much longer telomeres and a little bit higher expression of telomerase. And so she used this HTQ fish assay to show, at least in mice, and she thinks this is true in, in uh, human beings, she's doing that experiment now. Uh, looking at where the stem cells live. And in the skin, there are more stem cell niches than anywhere else, including bone marrow. Once again, if you can get to them with the right kind of stuff, you can have a meaningful impact on the behavior of that organ system, in this case, uh, the skin. Now, I didn't include an extensive bibliography uh, at the end of this. There's just a couple things for you to read if you really want to. But I would encourage you to look up Maria Blasco on PubMed if you're interested in stem cells or telomeres, there's a lot of interesting stuff, and I think she's one of the premier scientists in the world. Uh, Ignacio Flores was the, uh, probably the guru of stem cells in Europe, uh, working alongside her with this particular um, study. Okay, skin aging. Now, we could take skin and we could actually make it, say, cell aging. 
Okay, instead for this slide, but again, it's a skin lecture. I'm talking to you about cosmeceuticals and regenerating skin with topical chemokines and cytokines. But I told you I would teach you a little bit about aging. And you folks all know this, all right? This is nothing new. I'm just going to say it in a different way and reframe it so you understand. Every seven years or so, with the exception of post-mitotic tissue like brain and heart, our bodies recycle themselves. So there's always repopulation going on. That repopulation is a combination of somatic cell division and stem cell uh, differentiation. I'm going to step out on a limb a little bit here because this is speculation. Because no one really knows uh, what the combination of to, to healing is. Um, do you remember in high school biology when they talked to you about wound healing? They showed you a little V cut and then they showed you cells demarginating coming in from the side and repopulating. Uh, if you're as old as I am, that was what they showed you because they didn't know about stem cells then. And everything was thought to be local cells. Probably not the case. There are circulating progenitor cells, and there are, of course, the actual stem cells in the niche that can, can uh, divide and provide uh, extra help for tissues to um, fill in the, uh, the gaps where somatic cells may not be able to do so. Um, no one has been able to show in, in any tissue, as far as I know, what the contribution of stem cells versus pre-existing somatic cells is. So here's my going out on the limb hypothesis. I think it's dependent on the replicative capacity or replicative demands of the tissue. I think things like skin, bone marrow, and GI tract, which are highly replicative and the cells have a pretty short half-life, require a larger contribution from stem cells, which may or may not be the reason why we have more stem cells in our skin. So the intrinsic aging is cellular division. You all know about telomeres. You've been hearing about them since I first gave a talk in 2009 and many, many other lecturers since. So. Um, Telomere erosion or loss of telomeres happens with every cell division unless you have some type of telomerase activity uh, to prevent that loss. Um, that is the biologic time clock. Now, ask any lecturer at this uh, symposium here, and you get a different answer as to what's the level of importance in telomeres and aging. Um, I think they're important. I'm willing to agree with lots of people. They're not the only thing, but I think they're important. And I can tell you that they're important in stem cell aging as well. It may not be the only thing, but there's something that we've got to handle on and we can uh, impact. So cell division is, is intrinsic aging. Every time that cell divides, it gets older. And at some point when the telomere gets shorter and the mitochondria gets sick and all kinds of other things happen inside the cell, that cell behaves like an old cell and either senesces or apoptosis or, in some cases, maybe becomes a cancer cell, depending on how sick the mitochondria are. And Dr. Seyfried, in our next lecture, is going to tell you a lot about that. So make sure you stay for that lecture, by the way. Extrinsic aging. Uh, in skin, the prototype is UV radiation and uh, near-infrared. This is from the sun. But we can simplify this and simply say radical oxygen species that are not able to be quenched. That's, that's extrinsic aging. It's also intrinsic aging. Some of the cells do this on their own. Now, what are the things that cause this? Well, you've been hearing a lot about lifestyle, okay? So lack of sleep is an inflammatory condition. Excess stress is an inflammatory condition. Low omega-3s is a very inflammatory condition. As a matter of fact, I happen to believe, and I spoke with Dr. Sears, and he shook his head in agreement, that the primary driver of inflammation that you can impact on, simply, is the actual omega-3, omega-6 ratio. So that's diet and nutrition. Um, stress we mentioned, sleep we mentioned, exercise. None, sedentary behavior, inflammatory. Too much, look at the overtrained athlete, inflammatory. So it's sort of the Goldilocks thing. You want to get it just right. Um, some of the recurrent themes you'll hear about. Uh, I mentioned mitochondrial dysfunction. You're going to hear a lot about that in the next hour with Dr. Seyfried. So once again, uh, this plays a much bigger role, not just in, in aging, but in cancer and in many other diseases, and it's just becoming recognized. So you definitely want to hear more about that. But it works in skin aging as well. The mitochondria don't function as well. Uh, MMPs, matrix metalloproteinases, you've been hearing about these off and on in cir circumstances of aging, diabetes, and cancer. Uh, we see these elevate in, uh, in aging skin. And then stem cell aging. Uh, just a comment that I made earlier, I'll reiterate that some stem cells appear to stay in the niche forever. Unless you're that poor Dutch lady, and then you only have a couple of them. Uh, characteristics of skin aging. The first four here, you can see these, okay? And the others are just happening underneath the surface, so to speak. 
The changes in collagen and elastin production, this gives us saggy skin, this allows wrinkles to, to uh, form, it also helps with thinning of the skin. Changes in the types of collagen and elastin, there are four or five different types of collagen, um, specifically type 1 and type 3 are the main ones that we see in skin, and these things start to juxtapose and change. Um, and this is a marker of senescence in our cells, dysfunction in our fibroblasts. But you can see similar things in the stem cells in their capacity and their ability as they march down the differentiation pathway to produce these kinds of things. Uh, vascular changes, there can be vascular endothelial dysfunction and thinning, there can be hypervascularity, angiomas. Uh, these are all things you see. Uh, look at any person that you deem as old and, and you'll see these kinds of things. And pigment accumulation, uh, my friend Aubrey de Grey calls this intracellular junk, lipofusion granules, etc. These things that the cell could get rid of when you were younger and cannot get rid of now. Immune changes, uh, inability to fight off infections as well because of lack of immune cells. This is probably a part of the mesenchymal stem cell aspect of skin. Mitochondrial changes, again, you're going to hear it and, and you, need to, you need to learn this uh, at a much greater level than, than it's been presented in most cases. And then finally, aberrant cell types. Um, anybody think they know what causes aging? <laughs> Nobody's brave. All right. Um, there's lots of definitions, but um, my, I wrote a book a few years back called The Immortality Edge, and my co-author, Mike Fossil, is one of the true godfathers of uh, aging, if you will, of, of looking at aging and thinking that we might be able to do something about it. And, and Mike's theory, and I have to agree with him, is that it's a, it's a damage control issue. As we age, we lose the ability to repair and regenerate. We don't necessarily see more damage. We see a lot of damage when we're young. We can repair it. We can fix it. We have these youthful uh, mechanisms that will help us do that. If we can potentially desenesce cells, which I'll show you that we can, and if we can potentially get those cells to act younger and be younger, we're going to have good results in, in our quest for age management medicine. All right. Here we go again, telomerase role, role of, uh, in, in cancer. Now, it depends who's standing up here. I'm a telomer guy, stem cell guy. I'm going to tell you that I think this is really, really important. There's going to be people who argue with me and say that there are other pathways, and I'll mention those pathways. And the truth is nobody's really teased out what it is that causes stem cells to age. But the more and more I read, the more and more I study, the more I see a unified situation where there are certain things that you hear over and over again, like radical oxygen species, uh, nitrogen-based uh, uh, oxidative uh, molecules, uh, lack of uh, radical oxygen defenses, uh, mitochondrial dysfunction, um, these are all things that I keep hearing over and over and over again in the context of pathology and of aging. Okay? Now, not everybody in this room considers aging a pathology. I actually do. Um, I really think it's a disease, and I think a lot of what we see uh, that we call diseases of aging, like heart disease, cancer, etc., can be linked to the aging process. Um, but I'll simply say this. I think uh, telomeres and telomerase are a big, play a big role in the aging of stem cells as well as somatic cells. Um, Epigenetic modifications are apparent. Again, we don't understand the epigenome. Uh, lecturer yesterday, Dr. Alan Wu, uh, Wu talked to you about epi, um, epigenetic marks, methylation, ubiquitination, acetylation, carbonylation, carboxylation, on and on and on and on. But he didn't mention the mitochondria. And I actually asked him about it, and Alan said, you know what? Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's a big thing. It's a huge thing. It's one of the biggest drivers of epigenetic changes. Um, you can look at cells and see changes in their cell surfaces. If I were to ask anybody in the room uh, what is a marker of a senescence in most cells, if I got an answer at all, which I probably wouldn't, but most people who knew the answer or an answer would say beta-galactosidase. It's a lot more sophisticated than that. There's a lot more of that out there. But if you know beta-gal, you're ahead of the game. All right, some genetic intrinsic regulatory pathways that change the behavior of the stem cells. These, by the way, are able to be influenced by cytokines and chemokines. Wintcatenin. Uh, Notch, Hedgehog, all of these are critical in, in the determination of stem cells, what they become, how they become, their ability to repopulate the niche, and obviously the aging process. Uh, we're not able to go in and, and uh, change genes as much as we'd like. Uh, some of you know about CRISPR and Talon technologies. These things are happening. But trust me, it's a lot easier to rub a cream on that gets into the skin stem cells than it is to go in and re-engineer the genes. So here is an article for those of you who want to know what the role of telomeres and telomere length is in stem cells. Now, I want to stress something to you, okay? We've been talking telomerase activation here for five or six years, and there are systemic telomerase activators on the market. 
Systemic telomerase activation is very different than topical telomerase activation. Two things, same things. Is the molecule effective, and can it get to where it needs to? Okay. All right. You already heard this. You know that when you induce pluripotent stem cells, you reset their telomeres, and I'm not going to say any more about that. What I want you to understand is that there are many cytokines and chemokines, and I'm going to uh, spare you the agony of reading uh, these article abstracts. I don't know if you folks do a lot of this kind of reading. I actually do. I read lots of books. I read abstracts and articles uh, and that kind of thing. So I'll sum this up for you, but if you really want to read the article, you can pull the reference, okay? Um, I simply read it. These agents are biologically active peptides and small molecules. They have a target cell. They can work through paracrine around the area, autocrine within the cell, juxtacrine right next door, or endocrine, meaning systemic. Okay? They're applicable to healing, aged skin, and multiple cell types are required to do that. The chemokines and cytokines that are uh, in a good preparation will address as many of those things as you can safely address. And most important ones there are epidermal growth factor, vascular endodermal uh, growth factor, fibroblast growth factors, and then IGF-1. Now, some of you look at these and say, wait a minute, I read cancer articles, and I see a lot of these in cancer. These are upregulated, okay? These, these molecules are usually upregulated in cancer, and there are many attempts to target these things to treat cancer. Um, and there's been a little bit of success, especially with the VEGF, but I think primarily, and I, I'm, I'm thinking that Dr. Seyfried will help us understand this, that the process of cancer is not reliant on one particular mitogen. There's something that happens first that, that creates these environments. And blocking one of these little molecules is probably not the answer. It's also not the answer to just give one of these molecules to try to de-age the skin. These are the, the whole list of the major ones, uh, where they work, how they work, and what they do. And this is all stuff you're familiar with. And I want to stress something to you about, we're, t we're talking in the context of wound healing and healing, and I'll show you slides of burns, I'll show you slides of cuts, I'll show you slides of those kinds of things. But you have to equate in your mind, as I do, that aging skin is actually a wound. This is a wounded uh, organ system. And so we can lateralize a lot of, and this is not always the case in medicine. You know, we're out there rescuing sick, dead, and dying people, okay? We, we can't always lateralize what we do to those people to regenerative medicine and anti-aging medicine and age management medicine. We can't always generalize that. But in this case, it works pretty well because aging skin behaves like a wo wounded organ system. More factors, okay, there's, there's a room full of pathways and there's a room full of factors here. Um, Essentially, these are mitogens, they cause growth, they cause differentiation, and they improve the behavior of the stem cells uh, and get them to do what we want them to do, which is behave younger. Okay, this is an interesting study, uh, and I'm going to sum it up for you at the bottom. You can see this is from 2010, so this is already four years old, but the conclusion is in combined treatment, and again, they didn't take uh, burn patients and give them nothing. Okay, there was no placebo. They, they decided that it was inhumane to not treat burn patients just to see if this worked. So they gave them the standard silver iodide type treatments. But then when they combined it with the recombinant human epidermal growth factor, they actually sped up the wounds in these elderly patients. Elderly is key here. Elderly suggestive of decreased stem cell uh, ability to regenerate. Okay. So this is not an ideal population, but it worked. Uh, recombinant human. Um, uh, the products we talk about use recombinant technology, okay? They take the genes, they put them in various and sundry vectors like E. coli and in some cases soybeans, and they generate these molecules, these chemokines and cytokines. And this is the same technology that's used for insulin and growth hormone. Um, it's not GMO, for those of you who are worried about it. We call it recombinant technology. Very safe, very well established. Okay. Concentrations and safety. This is a study that was done quite some time ago, and it's summed up by saying that there are certain specific concentrations you need, and if you stay within the parameters of, of those concentrations, these things are safe. Again, I use the word mitogen, and whenever I use the word mitogen, the word cancer should pop up in your head. Okay? Oncogenic and mitogenic are not the same thing. Please keep that in mind. But any mitogen could potentially, could potentially, in a high enough concentration, cause a problem. 
especially in this case, you want to put a, a skin cream on somebody who's had some basal cells or squamous cells. My recommendation is you avoid those areas. But there are safe FDA-approved levels of this that still work, but don't seem to foster uh, carcinogenesis or increase the, the uh, uh, transformation of precancerous lesions. Um, this is the, the salient study way back in 2002 that showed that stem cells are involved uh, through, through growth factor uh, and cytokine and chemokine stimulation. These are the things that are actually healing. Stem cell activation is a major feature in skin. Remember I told you we don't know what the contribution is? Well, in skin, the outer layer is dead, okay? So it's not contributing very much to cellular regeneration. So in this case, we can, we can point our finger and say most of this is happening due to stem cell uh, expansion and differentiation down the pathways. Really, really cool study here. Remember I talked to you about repopulating a niche. Some stem cells take a 180 degree turn. Uh, this is a study that first showed that. It's been shown several times since that time in skin and small intestine. So far, not seen in other areas. Um, but again, not every area has been studied with the same degree that these have. Um, these slides are not going to make a whole lot of sense. I apologize. Um, what they're supposed to show is proliferation at the epidermal uh, dermal junction of, um, uh, in this case, uh, fibroblasts. And then differentiation as these cells march out toward, I'm sorry, uh, these are epidermal cells, as they march out towards the surface. Um, and this marching out of this movement during differentiation has been fairly well described in several tissues. Again, small intestine. There are crypts, and you can watch the, the, the stem cells go out and become intestinal lining cells as they move physically through space. So you have to be able to move these things. These things have to be able to, to migrate. Um, and what this slide slides are supposed to show is that some of these cells actually stop and turn around and go back. And that, that's what I call repopulation. Um, they use this uh, uh, different terms for it. But keep in mind that it doesn't impair the regeneration. These, these patients with leg ulcers still had successful regeneration of the skin and, and the ulcers. And this is under treatment with chemokines and cytokines. Okay, how did you get them? Originally you had to inject them. Uh, then we got into fine needling, and now we have nano encapsulation. Okay, remember I said to you two things. Does it work, and can you get it there? So you, you've got to be able to get your topical cytokine and chemokine into that dermal epidermal junction, which means it needs to be protected to some degree. It means it needs to be able to pass through uh, gap junctions of the skin. And it means, to some degree, it has to be lipid soluble. Um, the nano encapsulation, which is kind of begged, borrowed, stolen from um, the pharmaceutical industry, was originally used to protect molecules as they pass through, through the gut. You make a little cell bilayer, and it helps uh, uh, deliver the product more distally. And in this case, uh, more distally means the epidermal dermal junction. Um, this is a picture of a nanoparticle and some of the benefits. Some of the benefits include uh, more area under the curve. So it's not a sudden kind of thing. And in, in this type of uh, um, therapy, you, you want to have more area under the curve. You want to have a little longer half-life. Um, and again, you have to be able to get it there first. If you don't put it in one of these things, it doesn't seem to get there. It seems to sit on the skin and degenerate. Or worse, cause some type of immune response uh, and is degraded by the, by the immune cells in the skin. Um, we haven't seen any problem with different skin types uh, using nanotechnology and delivering these cytokines and chemokines. I'm going to skip the role of mesenchymal stem cells. Uh, that'll be for the didactic lecture. Um, okay, here's the caution. And it's something you should know. Um, again, lots of talk about telomerase activation. I want to really, really stress to you. Molecule size is very important, and delivery is very, very important. So I don't know, you know of all the things that are working out there and not working out there, all I know is these, okay? I know that these growth factors work, and I know that epidermal growth factor one is, in fact, a telomerase activator, okay? Um, mitogens are not carcinogenic, but they may, in the presence of cancerous transformation, accelerate growth, or they may accelerate the growth of cancer cells. Again, it's probably dose-dependent. Many cancers make these things themselves to, to allow themselves to survive, and again, I don't want to even go there. That, that's the next lecture. Um, but um, generally speaking, from what I've seen specifically in telomerase activation, you're pissing in the ocean, 
with using oral telomerase activator or something in terms of what the cancer can do. Cancers generally are cranking these things out in much, much higher doses than we could ever deliver pharmacologically, unless we actually try to deliver them pharmacologically in massive doses, which so far I don't think we have. Um, there are upper safe limits, FDA has established, and uh, again, there are, there are some multiple pathways that are associated with these things, um, including telomerase activation. All right, here's where we get to the parts I want you to remember. Just remember stem cells do lots of different things, and they do age, okay? They age by the same mechanisms, uh, telomere attrition, radical oxygen species, nit nitrogen, oxygen, uh, nitrogen uh, radical species, um, trauma, um, et cetera, et cetera. So they don't last forever. Um, skin is very amenable because it's close to the surface. You have dermal epidermal uh, junctions, and in those junctions you have tons and tons of stem cell niches that you can get to. Okay? So you can get it there if you use the right type of technology to do it. Recirculation is possible, so you don't need to worry about burning out the stem cell niche like the Dutch lady. Okay? Um, I'm going to show you some pictures now. Um, skip this. Skip this. Just a reminder about the growth uh, factors of many different things. There are peptides, amino acids, enzymes. These are not all the same size. So uh, some folks were asking about the, the sprays versus the emulsions. Um, the nanoparticulate stuff is, is more useful for delivering the larger of the small molecules. The really tiny peptides you don't need to nano encapsulate. Right, here's an efficacy test. This is just a simple picture. Um, how many people came by the booth the other day and let me put the stuff on the back of their hands? Anybody here? Okay. You will relate to this, okay? I think you'll, you'll, you know, this is what was happening with your skin when you were saying, oh my God. Um, now, this is at two weeks, so the oh my God is going to be a little bigger. And I'm not telling you that we turn on your stem cells in, in 10 minutes or five seconds, okay? That's not, that's not what's happening there. That's all those other wonderful things in there, the humectants and the, the, the moisturizers, et cetera. But you will see changes in the skin surface uh, at about two to three weeks in using uh, an appropriate uh, cytokine and chemokine uh, com combination with an appropriate delivery system. Um, so between two and three weeks, that's the, the length of time. And what does this translate into? Um, these are some of the things that we've used them on. I, I can't name the condition in the first slide because then I'd be making a medical claim. Uh, some of these slides were taken abroad where they have less stringent laws. Um, there is blemishes over in the, what would be the top uh, right. Um, uh, wrinkle diminution on the forehead there and then fine wrinkles around the mouth and eyes. Now, these are the kinds of results you're going to see. Now, it's not Botox and it's not plastic surgery, but people are very gratified to see this. The spray contains these. These are 15 uh, uh, tiny little peptide molecules that have all been shown to activate stem cells. And then this is a personal experiment. Okay, so when the RG cell folks came to me and said, we want you to, to be our guy, we want you to sell our product, I said, well, fine, but I've got to test it. Little did they know that I work for a stem cell lab as well. And um, so this is a very simple experiment. This is nothing super fancy, okay? But this is the industry standard, and it's collagen production. And I'm going to, I've simplified it here. Uh, there's all kinds of things that a scientist would want to know that are not included here. But there's three pictures at the top, A, B, and C. And collagen production is basically documented by the increased red. The more red, that's collagen production. And as you can see, the C condition, there's more collagen and more red than there is in the, the first conditions. The green bars are cellular viability. This is treating these cells. In this case, uh, we did the experiment with two different uh, cell types. We did fetal fibroblasts, which are stem cells, and adult fibroblasts, which are not. And um, this one actually represents the adult uh, population. When it's untreated, it's the small green bar. When you treat it with the serum, it's the middle green bar. And when you add the booster at about, uh, I believe that's 18 days there, um, of treatment at a level that you would be able to reproduce on the skin, um, you get that. So you get increased viability of these cells. Um, the collagen matrix is just a way of measuring how much collagen you make. Again, the first condition is no, no therapy. The, the middle condition is the serum, and then finally the serum and the booster. Okay, there's some additional reading for you if you want to learn it. I think it's a fascinating topic. Um, I think stem cells are in, gen in general are a very fascinating topic. And um, you'll hear more about them, obviously, and hopefully I'll be able to deliver some more didactic lectures to you. 
Um, but we can impact the aging of skin. We can change the way we look in a positive fashion. And how many of you are actually clinicians, anti-aging clinicians, age management clinicians? How many of you are age management clinicians? Okay, some of you are there. So one of the things that's going to get your patients to like you is if you can make them look better. And that's the truth. Okay, I didn't make this world. I just live in it. Uh, there are many, many times we, we talk to patients and we say, look, your cholesterol's better and your inflammatory markers are better. And you're like, doc, oh, I don't feel any better, you know, okay. Or I don't look any better, okay. Remember, they're people. They want results, and they want visible results. And if you can give them to them, they're going to like you a lot more, and they're going to come continue to see you more. Um, and I can tell you that we've had no trouble retaining at least 75 to 80 percent of our original customers after two years using these products. Um, I also want to remind you of the next lecture. Please stay for the next lecture. It's going to be phenomenal. Um, I have a few minutes uh, if anybody wants to ask questions. Um, if not, um, let me have Dean Miller come up and, uh, no questions? Uh, is that succinct? Oh, there's a question, yes. Yeah. Not in the, not in the U.S. Okay. She asked if we've done skin biopsies treating with, the, with these particular, and this is a good question, of course, because you know, in vitro versus in vivo. Um, and the answer is, Biopsies have been done, but not in the United States of America. Now, will we ever do that? Most likely we will. I'll tell you another thing we're trying to do with this, and we, again, it takes a certain amount of funding to do this, but we'd actually like to look at the, uh, the uh, stem cell biomarkers and go into, we, my company has all kinds of stem cells, including senescent ones. And so we could treat, uh, what we really would like to do at some point is show that we desenesce them as well. So yes, we will probably be doing skin biopsies in the U.S. Um, once there's a little bit more, um, funding for that, but those, those things have been done uh, in Korea, and they actually do show uh, very similar results. Um, other questions? Okay. One other question back there, yes, sir? I, actually, I do too. Now, it's an off label indication, but I like my hair and I want more of it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's just gratifying to hear, and, and we hear a lot of that, and that's what that's what uh, that's what we want to hear. That's that's what we're trying to do. You know, I mean, we come here to re regenerate our bodies, uh, and this is the most visible thing that we can see. Now, we want you to be healthy, obviously, but healthy skin is part of that equation. Any other questions or comments? Okay, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Dean Miller, who's the CEO of RG Cell. And again, Mark, thank you. So, thanks so much.